uh, a message entitled, How to Have a Miserable Life. <coughs> I'm sure there'll be a long line for, uh, for that title, but, uh, but it, it really is what the enemy offers. Anything that's short of the fullness of what Jesus has to offer is counterfeit and empty, and it's the surest way to a miserable life to not receive and accept what Jesus Christ has done, to know that you're loved and accepted, to know that your past is gone and that your future is bright. Oh my gosh, what's, what can be better than that? And I really appreciated everybody who, their yea gods this morning, right? Scripture and Revelation says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and loving not our lives unto death. Right, all three of those are just really powerful, but just to think that our testimony is in the same thought as the blood of the lamb is super powerful because the blood of the lamb is the most powerful thing in the universe but we overcome by the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony and not holding on to our own lives the word of your testimony is powerful and we get we get life and encouragement when you are willing to share you know the breakthrough that you've experienced the answer to prayer that you've experienced the there was substance in this morning's yay gods right i mean people that uh that that shared this morning many of them I know I know much of the stories and you know people don't get to substance without going through a fair amount of valleys in the journey of life because because it's it's an equal opportunity rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous alike it's just what do we let happen inside of us as we go through the process and you know I'm, I'm blessed that we get to fellowship with people who've paid some dues and have earned some earn some stripes and um, not that it's not to imply that it's it's by our works but just you know there's something built inside of us that um, that requires us to to live a life that seeks Jesus even when we don't feel like it even when our circumstances don't look like he's moving even though we don't see it you're moving that that it, it takes something inside of us to just keep putting one foot or the other in trust and faith and that's a different kind of life than, oh, it feels good. No, I get to go to heaven and I get to not go to hell. Woohoo! Right? That's, 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 you know, that's one level. And I sure like people to, to say that and, uh, versus saying nothing. But God wants to take us so much deeper in our relationship with him. Because as was also mentioned in the Yea Gods, it's, it's not about that we know him. It's about that we let him know us. It's about the intimacy of relationship that we, that we cultivate. And um, I've been very aware, I, I don't know who shared it, but I've been pretty aware of how, of how easy it is to just be, just be distracted by life and to take our eyes off of Jesus. And um, the thought that we pray without ceasing, that thought that we fellowship without ceasing, that we keep our spiritual gaze on him without ceasing, like all the time, no mat matter what's going on here, but that we keep this fellowship going, it's possible. In fact, it's necessary. And for those of us who sometimes go through life like, okay, I'm going to come to church and recharge, or I'm going to go, you know, and, oh, hey, I've read my Bible in a few weeks. I better pick up my Bible, right? That, that sometimes those times of I'll, I'll handle it on my own until I crash. Anybody ever felt like that? Yeah, no, I got a God till I, till I come to my next, you know, ditch. <coughs> And then we need somebody to help pull us out. But God's inviting us into fellowship with him without ceasing. And it's possible, it's essential that we cultivate and that we don't, we don't ever let our eyes off of what the Holy Spirit's doing. Just because we got something going on here, I, I can't stop listening to the Holy Spirit right here, right now. Just because I'm having a conversation with you doesn't mean that I can ever take my eyes off the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by that. And I don't know if in your life it's true, but when I feel stress or I feel anxiety building up on me, you know, there's the dashboard lights on the car flashing at me saying, hey, idiot, you know, we call them idiot lights, right, where I'm from. We call them idiot lights on your dash. When it comes on, it says, hey, when's the last time you checked your oil? Idiot lights, right, because you're supposed to check your oil every time you fill up, right? Everybody knows that. Do you all check your oil when you fill up your car? Anyway, <laughs> that's an aside. But the idiot light comes on in my life, and it's called stress or anxiety. Comes up and blinking on the light, you know, blinking. Well, you guys at least pay attention to the low fuel light, right? At least that one, the little orange fuel, fuel light. At least that one, that one's blinking on the dash saying, 
you know what, stress and anxiety are sure signs that you're trying to carry this on your own and that you've gotten your eyes off of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps our stress and anxiety are byproducts of our unwillingness to discipline ourselves to keep our spirits tuned into him. Sila. Or maybe that's just me. But I think, uh, I think sometimes it's, it, takes, it takes discipline where he says to bring every thought captive. It takes a discipline inside of us to say, you know, I'm not going to be distracted by lesser things. I'm going to keep my eyes on. And, that's, and that's, a, that's a focus of my spirit more than it is, okay, well, I'm going to spend 24-7 reading my Bible. It's a focus of our eyes, our internal eyes, the eyes of our spirit to say, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. So today we, uh, we get to celebrate communion. This is the, we celebrate communion on the first Sunday of every month, and today's the day. So I'm excited about that. And <coughs> so what was on my heart to share this morning was, uh, as, if, as if God didn't already share plenty, it was super good already this morning. I feel very edified, both in worship and in everybody's obedience and sharing. So I appreciate that. Um, but to talk about what a covenant-keeping God is and the power that comes through covenant, and so for our, for, we'll see how far I get in the message today, but um, for our opening, help me. Okay, well, there it is. I'm just on its own time. Uh, the power of covenant <coughs> today. And um, to explore, we're just going to explore, God is a God of covenant, and there's covenant all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. We're just going to explore three of them today. We're going to talk about God's covenant with Abraham, God's covenant with Moses and the children of Israel and God's covenant with you and to see what what God wants to um, we'll see later on in the message it ties in with what came out in the prophetic but there is an invitation this morning uh, for God's covenant with you that he's going to invite you to something deeper and more real even in relationship with him today so the power of covenant this might frustrate me Could you put a new battery in it for me, please? Okay. <sighs> Keep my eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> so God's covenant with Abraham. I'll jump in because I, I know there's a couple slides up here, but there's a, that I'll probably mess up the order of, but this, this idea that God is a covenant-keeping God. <laughs> there's uh, the, the section of scripture um, out of Genesis for our first passage, and that's, that's your reference up there, Genesis 15. Uh, out of the New American Standard says this. He says, but he said, Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So God had just promised Abraham, hey, listen, I'm going to give you all of this land, all of this land of, of people who are idol worshipers and adverse to you. I'm going to give all this land to you, Abraham. Abraham is a kind of an interesting study. Uh, I would love for somebody to do a, a message on just where, where the origins are of all the people, patriarchs, and how it comes through and relates to modern day geography. But, um, but Abraham is of the, right, so we know that after the flood, right, Noah had three sons, right, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So where the descendants of Ham and Japheth went and the descendants that came from them is a really fascinating study. A lot of, lot of, lot of creeps that came out of, of their descendants. But the line of Shem was the line where the priesthood and the remembrance of God, God always keeps a remembrance, right? So he looked all around to find Noah. And Noah's like, uh, the only guy left who's got his eyes still on God, who remembers. So the enemy has two agendas always, and has since the beginning. It's to, w to wipe out the remembrance of God from, from humanity. And he's done it pretty well in a couple of different times throughout history, right? It says in the time of Noah that everyone was doing just what was right in their own eyes. They weren't doing what was right based on what God said. They were doing what was right based on some sort of subjective internal, hey, this feels good, but I think we should do this, and I'm stronger than you, so I think we should do this, whatever it is. Something other than the standard that God established is their governance for life. Maybe that sounds a little familiar in our own culture, but it says that during that time that they, God looked to and fro to find anybody righteous on the earth, and he found one dude, right? He found Noah, who, who the, the Bible says was righteous before God. And that's just stunning. 
I mean, you know, with the time span and the age of people that they lived and the amount of time when they started having kids, you know, they waited till they were 100 in some cases to have their first kid, right? But they're having kids till they're 800, right? How many, how fast could the Earth have populated? So, uh, uh, you know, I've heard some speculate that the Earth's population at the time of the flood was just as much or more than it is right now. I mean, just imagine the, just the sheer volume of this thought of, you know, several billion people without any remembrance or recollection of the God who said, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is what I say. This is how I've created you. This is the path that I've created for you to walk in a prosperous and blessed life. And that's, that remembrance has been wiped out from, wiped out from humanity. So that's the one thing. Satan's goal is to eliminate the remembrance of God from humanity. Second thing is he wants to wipe out those who are called by the name of God and who are still following him. That's why there's only Noah left. And in Abraham's time, even his father was an idol worshiper, f a descendant of Shem, right, from the priestly line that God keeps his, he keeps his promise and he keeps his promise alive through Shem, through the priesthood, even at the time of Abraham, still yet again, we're back already to a place within 500 years, we're back into a place of everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. That n the, the enemy's agenda has never changed. It's the same playbook over and over again. How can I wipe out the remembrance of God from people? And how can, I, how, can I, how can I remove those who are called by the name of the Lord? So back to, the, back to our passage in Genesis 15. <clears throat> he said, Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. Okay, so he went and got several animals, split them in half, in the preparation for a covenant to be made with Abraham by God. Verse 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great n darkness fell upon him. Then God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Think of what this might be referring to. Your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not yours, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Anybody know where that is? But I will judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. He's prophesying something that doesn't happen for a few hundred years yet into the future after the time of Abraham. And he's saying, you know, your descendants are going to go in and you're going to be enslaved for 400 years. And yet when you leave, you're going to spoil them. You're going to take out, you're going to leave with great possessions. Pretty amazing what God prophesies. And this is one of the most profound things that helps us to know that what we read is true. What we read in the word of God is true. Is the fulfillment of prophecy, things that were written from hundreds, in some cases thousands of years before, that are all fulfilled in great detail right in front of our eyes. And here's one brewing. As for you, you shall go down to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the wrongdoing of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, a smoking oven and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between these pieces. So we see a God preparing to make, preparing a covenant, uh, preparations for the covenant, and what did they include? Right, well, they included included blood, right? And whose blood did it include? It was, in this case, it was blood of animals, right? That, that essentially ratifies the covenant, which is pretty, which is pretty, it's, you, it makes you think of Native American ceremonies and other cultures that, that do this blood mingling of the blood and call them blood brothers. But it makes you, this is, this is, you know, ancient thought that blood ratifies a covenant. So in this case, it's the, it's the blood of animals. So thoughts about covenant in Hebrew culture. So we think of covenant mostly, we think of contractual, right? We think, okay, well, you do your part, I do my part, and so we got this, you know, okay, we got this business agreement, but it's a little deeper in the Hebrew culture, and here's some thoughts. It means to select the best for the other. It means a dedicated bond between each other. It means a shared inheritance, and it means, like in contract, it means that there's an agreement. So there's an implication of like when we make a covenant, we are bound together and what's mine is yours and what yours is mine. 
like even this thought that inheritance includes those that have now become a part of me, who've now become, we become deeply engaged in relationship, not just, just a contract, not just, not just a spelled out with our terms, but like a holy giving of ourselves to one another and becoming deeply, intimately family. It's a little deeper understanding, huh? And this is the other thought. So those of you who watched uh, Before the Wrath, oops, it's working well now. Those who watched Before the Wrath, the movie Before the Wrath, we, we learned that in the Galilean wedding ceremony that this cup that we get to partake of today in communion, that in this cup that there was a, there was a covenant that was also established by the sharing of a cup. And um, I, I, I think it's just really beautiful. But in the context of the Galilean wedding ceremony, you guys will remember, we've shared about this a couple of times, but, but in, the, in the marriage, in the betrothal process, the groom would bring a cup and he would present it to the bride. And the bride would, would if she didn't take the cup, she was saying no to his proposal. Right, so this is the beginning of their betrothal, right? Because often it would take a year to 18 months before they were actually married because of all the preparations that need to happen for the wedding and he needed to go and build a place for her. So all this beautiful stuff that Jesus then ties back into his promise and his covenant with you. But the cup would be extended to the bride and she had, she had all the power in her hand. Like I'm down on one knee and she can say no. And if she says no and doesn't take the cup, then nothing happens right the end this is this is the end and it's in front of witnesses so she she has all the power to say yes or no but when she takes the cup and she drinks of the cup and hands the cup back and he drinks of the cup there is a there is a covenant that is made there's there is good as married in law so there's other stuff that happens before they consummate their marriage but uh, another year to 18 months of when they would come together but this is another form of establishment of covenant. So it happens with blood, and it happens with the sharing of a cup of covenant. Both beautiful expressions of covenant promise with those that you love. In this case, it was covenant contract with someone he was going to marry. Okay, secondly, God's covenant with Moses. Our section of scripture there is in Exodus 12. And here's the and here's the context. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take yourselves lambs according to your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two and the two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall keep this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? Then you shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, because he passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but he spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. God making a contract, making a covenant with Moses and his people and the children of Israel, that God would call his people, fulfilling what was just prophesied in the section that we just read about you're going to be taken away as as slaves and you're going to be away for 400 years but God's going to bring you back and he's going to restore you we alluded to last week about um, the the specialness of the plagues that God chose to deal with Egypt and there's this constant hardening of of Pharaoh's heart six times it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart but then four times it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart there's this there's this God bringing a showdown in one part of this is God bringing a showdown like we talked about last week with all of those who say I'm God worship me so he dealt with the Nile and he dealt with the goddess of fertility and he dealt with all those things that the Egyptian worshipped instead of the one true God and he dealt with that to start with 
But where does it end? It ends with the killing of the firstborn. And you see a progression throughout the plagues of intensity. And it's like God's giving opportunity after opportunity for re true repentance to happen in their hearts, and yet knows that it won't because the idolatrous heart of the Pharaoh and his people, what their hearts were connected and committed to, what they really truly worshipped inside was demonstrated by the very last plague. The very last plague, when we elevate man and we elevate, so Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. And so when people come and would approach Pharaoh and say, hey, you know, I, I, I wonder if this is really the best course of action. And finally, his, his close counselors came to him as, as things have escalated just before the last plague. And he's like, how long, they're saying to their deity that they worship as God and man, who is, what is this and how long are you going to continue with this? Because our whole country has been wiped out. And yet Pharaoh, again, hardens his heart. And so God's judgment is, is against this ultimate idolatry which says that man is God. I think it's really significant in the time that we're watching right now. I had a, I had a really disturbing conversation this week with a, with a, uh, a member in, uh, on the Big Island. Uh, um, not really a political position, but a really significant position. I'm not going to mention it here, but, but that relates to enforcement of COVID type things and I I called with some with some concerns about what was what what was going on and and uh, the details aren't all that important but um, but the end of the conversation is really important because it was maybe less than a five-minute conversation and uh, the the gentleman cut the conversation very short and you know abruptly closed the conversation but not until he said as I mentioned I said you know um, funny all over the country states are treating unalienable rights as revocable privileges that can be suspended at the will of the state I don't know if that sounds like a controversial statement to you but but as people who love the law right who are law abiding and we have a law we have we have a law right we have a law that governs us it's the highest law that there is but but from this is derived what we call our Bill of Rights which is a pretty amazing law and states of emergency don't suspend it. They just don't. And no governor, no, no uh, uh, president can in certain wartime situations, right, but suspend it for a specific time. But, but really, literally, no governor, no politician has the authority to suspend the highest law of the land, even in times of if, I even if it seems to be a crisis. And so uh, my comment was, you know, funny how a lot of states have deemed these as revocable just at their will and uh, and the impact that it has on our country instead of recognizing these are unalienable rights granted by God I didn't think that was a real dramatic sensational statement but his next comment was well that's if you believe in a God and then he hung up the phone he said I got to go out other calls and hung up the phone and I just thought that was amazingly telling very troubling <laughs> very troubling because once you take God out of the picture and the existence of higher law that says that that doesn't matter whether you're the king or whether you're shoveling coal doesn't matter that this law applies to all of us that's what the basis of our republic is this isn't a sorry this is not a political I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here but the basis of our republic means rule of law and rule by law we're not a democracy. We're never formed as a democracy. Just because you say it 10 billion times doesn't make us a democracy. Democracy is mob rule, right? Two wolves and a sheep voting on who's, what we're going to have for dinner. That's what Abraham, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what Benjamin Franklin uh, likened. He says, he said, uh, if we, if we choose this, then, you, you know, we're going to end up as um, homeless in the land that their father, that their, that their, that their fathers conquered. And, and that's the deal, right? That's the progression of when you take a law that's higher than all of us and you suspend that. If you don't believe there's a God, then you don't believe that there is a higher law. And therefore, anything really goes. Because I'm the boss and I have a bigger gun than you do or, a, or I'm stronger than you are. Whatever my advantage is, what's right is what I say it is. And this is, this is the elevation of man, the worship of man. This is what God dealt with on the final plague in Egypt. He dealt with, you're going to lift up and worship this creation of mine made after my own image that I made really awesome. But you think that outside of me that it can be elevated and it can be all that? Then I got something to say about that. 
And, and he did. And his last, his last judgment was taking this propensity inside of the human heart to want to be God, to want to be the end all, to be the one who decides what's moral and immoral, what's right or wrong, lawful or unlawful, based on the fact that I say so. And this is what God dealt with in the very last plague. And it's, it's a, a s repetitive path walked down, and yet we serve a God who is never intimidated by that. It's where they were at in multiple times throughout history, and yet God just says, you know what? Time for a showdown. Time for a showdown. He who answers by fire, you worship and you serve him. He who really can establish and change the laws of nature and bend them to his will because he created them all, you worship and serve him. He who answers by power, you serve and worship him. He who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I don't mind having a showdown with you, right? We'll see who's really, and he's not intimidated and he's not insecure. And so for us, we get to, we get to see this invitation by this God who says, not only am I all powerful, but I'm, but I'm humble. And I came to serve and lay down my life a ransom for many, and I want to know you personally and for real. Amazing. Amazing that this is the nature and the disposition of the God that we serve. So the picture above shows the, shows the application of the blood above the doorstep and on the sides. So in, in God's covenant with Abraham, we saw he, animals were were killed and divided in half and they would pass between the two parts of the animals and it was part of the establishment of the covenant. There was also another blood that was spilled later on as God establishes and that was the, the blood spilled through the circumcision. So Abraham sp spilled blood, the animals spilled blood and in this case again we have animals spilling blood that ratifies the, the covenant. The, the blood over the doorpost causes judgment to pass over their families and in Goshen, they get to be free from all of the plagues that are ransacking, destroying, demolishing Egypt. And that's been part of my prayer also, that God has a Goshen for his people. It doesn't matter where you're at, there is a Goshen that God has for you that's under his covering and his protection, provided that we rely and trust on him. And it's powerful. Causes them to bypass the most extreme of all the judgments against Egypt. Okay, so blood of divided animal, blood of circumcision, blood on the doorposts. So the blood of, the blood is who's shedding the blood, changes slightly, but there's some consistency, but it's blood being shed that ratifies the, co the covenant. And finally, God's covenant with you. What's God's covenant with you look like? <coughs> Our section of scripture I have on the slide. This thing is driving me nuts. Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of covenant, which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. So here you have the same inference. The cup inferring the blood. The blood is what establishes the, con the, the covenant. And whose blood are we talking about here? God sheds blood himself. God gives of himself. And he's the one who sheds blood in this final covenant. Not Abraham not animals, but God himself saying, I will, I will pour out my life source. What is blood? Yes, it represents my life source. Without blood, we don't have life. And so God says, I will pour out my life source to make a covenant relationship with you. But the allusion to the cup is also really beautiful because it tells us what kind of covenant we're not thinking about a covenant as in, okay, well, okay, you do your duty and you take that land over there and I'll take this land over here like a contract would be. We're t the intimacy of covenant is implied in this. You see the picture of the cup being handed and offered to say, would you accept my proposal? I, I, I want us to live together for all of eternity. I want us to celebrate knowing and being known for all of eternity. 
I want us to be close and inseparable for all of eternity. This is the blood of the cup of covenant that I offer and extend to you. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to us every single day that God invites us into intimacy with him. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom because the other part of the Galilean, the fulfillment was in the wedding feast. A year, 18 months later, he's already built onto his Father's house and made a place for his bride. As Jesus has gone away and made a place for us, he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to make a place for you. He's making a place for us to come and consummate the wedding, to go in and feast and to live together forever. Jesus has gone away and already done those preparations. Right? So then he's just saying, you know what, when we drink this cup again, we drink this cup at the party that celebrates that we get to consummate our, what we've done in establishing our covenant. And so that's when he says he gets to drink of it again. And he's inviting us this morning into a covenant relationship with him. And when we partake of communion here in just a little bit, I just want this to be an encouragement, an invitation to remember that when we partake of this and we do this in remembrance of him, we're doing this in remembrance that he is a God of covenant. He's a God of covenant with Abraham. He's a God of covenant with Moses. He's a God who keeps his promises generation to generation to generation. We see what's going on. We think that, um, that time for us, you know, it seems like we're a long time where this is distressing or whatever, and God looks at it and says, it's, it's, it's so such a small part of the fulfillment of my ultimate plan. Don't lose heart. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to the thought that, that you feel overwhelmed or give in to anxiety. And we'll read the scripture in just a little bit, but because those who are for us are more than those who are against us. <coughs> so whose blood does the ratification? What does the cup signify? What kind of a contract are we entering? We're entering into a marriage contract, a marriage covenant and being invited into a marriage covenant with our Creator. The power of the cross, the foolishness, or the power of God to salvation. Brother shared earlier, it's the, it's the power of cross and nothing else. It's the power of blood of Jesus and nothing else that is the gospel message. It's what we need to extend to everyone. When we encourage everyone, I've been closing most of my conversations with encouragement, emails, texts, whatever. Hey, be sure to be looking up. It's time to be looking up emailed ba or uh, text back and forth with a friend in Leilani. Hey, you know what? We got to be looking up, right? This is where our hope comes from. Join me in this prayer. And so I sent him a prayer. And we need to be recognizing, as Brother shared, that there are people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life that are dependent on us giving and encouraging, drawing to, giving the invitation to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ. And so be encouraged to extend the invitation of covenant that God wants to make, not just to ratify and renew again with us, but to make to those that are a part of your sphere of influence, that he's saying, you know what, everything that the world has to offer Everything that the world offers is a counterfeit of the depth that God intends from the beginning. And he's inviting us to something substantive and real and eternal. <coughs> so this was the other thing on my heart this morning was to remind us of what this omnipotent, all-powerful God, to remind us that not only is he a God of covenant, but he's a God of humility and service. And um, we just had a bunch of great servants come and help decorate the church this weekend. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that. It, uh, it, it does a lot. Sometimes we think of our service and those things that, the things that s we struggle with are often those things that seem more mundane. And I was just reminded as, you know, like I, I've been just taking my time through the book of Luke, right? And I, I finished this morning. But um, the, f the number of times that in Luke where we are reminded of how Jesus just did what he saw the Father do and how committed he was to simple obedience. And it didn't really matter. Like, I don't judge my obedience based on, oh, that's hard. I don't think I want to do that. 
Oh, that's easy. That sounds fun. Oh, hey, the rain, it's raining today. I don't want to do that. Oh, it's sunny day. I want to do that. It's not based on any of that. It's just, it's just obey. I don't put any judgment on it. I don't say it because it's hard or because it's easy. I don't do any of that. It's just, it just is. It's just obedience. And that's, that's what Jesus models for us. It, it, I, don't, I don't put all these other qualifiers on it. He says it, it and I do it. And the childlikeness and the lowering of Christ himself to say, I'm going to take on that form of a servant, we need to be reminded of. Because we sometimes make these judgments in our obedience to the Holy Spirit. At least I do. Make these judgments. And I think that God is challenging us this morning to challenging us in our obedience. Not only is he reminding us of this covenant relationship that he's invited in, that he's ratified in, that he is a covenant promise-keeping God, but that he also wants to remind us that our role also in this is this childlike submission and trust in him because he is the bridegroom. So a couple scriptures on Christ as, our, as the servant. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. We overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by loving not our lives unto death, just like Jesus modeled. I don't make judgment. It's just about obedience. I do only what I see the Father do. Love that scripture. Luke 22, and he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles domineer over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way for you. Rather, the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? It is not the one who reclines at the table, but what does he say? But I am one among you as one who serves. John 13. Then when he washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're correct, for so I am. So if I, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example so that you also would do just as I did for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent you. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things great that you pack more knowledge in your head and memorize more scripture but really the ultimate test is obedience isn't it context of this right after the Passover meal where we get our celebration of communion the Eucharist which comes from the Egypt, the Egypt time of putting the door they, they, were, they were instructed to get a lamb without blemish on the 14th day of the Hebrew month and this was to become a, a ritual, something that, they, uh, something that they celebrated forever. The same components from that spotless lamb that allowed the judgment to pass over them comes right back up and Jesus says, I am that Passover lamb. I am the one who sheds my blood on your behalf, not the blood of animals, not the blood of Abraham, not but I shed my blood in order to ratify this contract with you. So this washing of the feet and this command to obey comes right after that whole thing of, listen, I'm inviting you into this celebration of a wedding feast. Mark 10:45. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke 18, 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the, one, the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Crazy thought to me that God himself is humble. That Jesus says, I humble myself and became obedient to death. That that humility, that uh, laying down my life, that obedience is such a hallmark of the life of Christ. C.S. Lewis says the fundamental thing is not what we think about God, but what 
God thinks about us. <clears throat> the, ele the elevation and the celebration of man and his intellect and his logic is the same kind of thing. Don't we have all these conversations all around us about what the nature of God is and how could a God who's loving do this, that, or the other thing? And we, we, br we stand in judgment of our creator. I mean, I'm the one sitting here deciding whether or not God is just or unjust. I mean, how high do I have to elevate myself to stand in judgment of God? And yet this is the propensity of the human condition outside of Christ. This, this is not humility. This is not the humbling of myself. This is the exalting of myself. In fact, the ultimate expression of it is, or part of the expression, maybe not the ultimate, but part of the expression of it, that is I want to rule over you too. Something inside of my heart that says I want to be the top dog, the alpha in the, in the pack, and that I want to rule over you. And Jesus says, I am the alpha in the pack, and let me model for you how to lay down your life and how to serve, and how to not promote yourself, but how to say, I will ratify my promise to you with my own blood, for God so loved the world that he gave. <coughs> So it's not so much what we think about God, but what God thinks about us. What is it that motivates you? What is it that draws you? What is, what is God's approval and God's affirmation say when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, because we engage intimacy and relationship with him and because we do what he says for us to do. Second Kings. So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What did he say? He said, Lord, I want you to open their eyes. How many of you can say, God, I want you to open my eyes? I want to see. God, I want to see from your viewpoint. I, God, forgive me for all these five senses that seem so dominant in my life. Help me to see from your perspective. Let me see from heaven's perspective. Let me see my current circumstances from your timeline outside of time and what it is and my part to play in it and and we don't we don't live as though we care about tomorrow because God's got tomorrow taken care of we live in trust and dependence today isn't that what we're called to do you know doesn't a lot of our stress and anxiety think about come from thinking about tomorrow I mean I'm, I'm convicted that that much of my stress and anxiety comes because I'm thinking about tomorrow what tomorrow might or might not look like and God says, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, we love not our lives unto death. Doesn't matter. Whether I live to live or die, it's all in God's timeline. If I, live, if I die today, it's God's perfect timing, then so be it. Because the living forever is because I've invested in, in eternity. That's where I store stuff up. My living forever is through the cross and only the cross. My living forever is by the grace of Jesus Christ and his blood shed for me. M my living forever is not based on any of my own performance. Religion is about performance. Religion is about your works. Relationship with him is about did I accept his invitation into the wedding ceremony. The opening of the eyes to see who he is. See his love, see his grace, see his moment-by-moment moment expressions of love towards you. This has, been, this has been what I've tried to do over the last couple of weeks. Like, every time I start to feel distraction, like, okay, well, all it, makes to, all it takes to bring us back to our attention on him and gratefulness is to focus on the moment-by-moment moment expression of his love towards me. It's all it takes to recalibrate us and to keep our eyes back on where they're supposed to be. See you the way that he sees you. So Luke 24, 37 through 40, for our closing scripture. Um, I just, the reminder of, the reminder that there was a wedding feast, and he went out, and the master invited everybody to the feast, but everybody was too busy. But then the people that came were those who were the humble and the ones who were homeless and the ones who didn't have anything to offer, and they came, and they got to participate in this grand feast. And I don't normally associate that the same thing with the wedding feast. It was a wedding feast for his son. I usually think of that, okay, well, thanks for inviting me to the party where I can watch the bride and the groom get married. Cool, right? We get to celebrate and, and cheer them on together. But what if that's not, what if that's not really the, 
the deeper meaning of the invitation. Maybe the invitation is, is that I'm inviting you because you are the bride. What if the invitation is because this has all been prepared just for you? What if the invitation is out there, and if you're not too busy today, that you get to go and you get to get married to the King of Kings? That you get to be invited into an intimate relationship forever with the King of Kings? Wouldn't that be awesome? You're not a spectator in this, right? We're not out here watching a distant God that we can't know. We're not out here watching everybody else who's more gifted or more, or more talented or more pretty or more handsome. Or we're, not, we're not sitting here watching and judging everybody else. The invitation has been handed to you. The invitation handed to you to come to the feast. And a part of that feast is there's this, this is the fulfillment of a, of a goblet being offered and accepted. And, and this is the celebration of the feast. This is going into the, the wedding ceremony. This is the party time after a year or a year and a half of preparation. And what if that's what God's inviting you to? Luke 24, 37 through 40. <coughs> Jesus says, be at peace. I am the living God. Don't be afraid. Why would you be frightened? Don't let doubt or fear enter your hearts, for I am. Come and gaze upon my pierced hands and feet. See for yourselves, it is I standing here alive. Touch me and know that my wounds are real. See that I have a body of flesh and blood. He showed him his pierced hands and feet and let them touch his wounds. The disciples were ecstatic yet dumbfounded, unable to fully comprehend. So Jesus is just raised again from the dead. And even though he told them over and over again, this is what's happening, they're dumbfounded, as, as, as we would be too, right? This is just too good to be true. And he lets them, he lets them actually, with their five senses, experience him. So we've, we've been subjugated to our five senses, right? The human body, the human existence, the spirit goes back inside, and now we've got to learn how to live by the spirit, not by just our senses. But God, in his love and his graciousness, he says, I'm going to actually allow you to, uh, in your human condition, I want you to experience me. Go ahead and put your hands in my wounds. Go ahead and see. And then he says, later on, he says, oh, hey, okay, so you're still, you're still in disbelief. Give me something to eat. And so he ate right in front of them to show that this is real, this is me really coming in and not just saying, blessed is he who having not seen yet believes, but he ministers to them in their human condition and says, I'm going to let you see. I'm going to let you experience. I'm going to let you touch. And then in uh, verse 45, he supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scriptures, then said to them, Everything that has happened fulfills what was prophesied of me. Christ, the Messiah, was destined to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Now you must go out into all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. Start right here in Jerusalem. Few are my witnesses, and I have been seen for yourselves all that has transpired, and I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in the city until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you. Where does he tell him to start? He says, yeah, you know, you're not, I'm not sending you out as missionaries to, to Africa today. I'm sending you out as missionaries to your next door neighbor. I'm sending you out as missionaries right outside of this church. This is not, this is not, this is awesome where we get to fellowship and encourage and exhort one another and experience God together. It's awesome, right? But the real ministry is just right outside. It's the next step. It's literally right on the, I mean, it's literally right outside the doors. Well, it's right here, too. Right? We have some ministering to do to each other as well, exhorting and encouraging one another. But ministry is, is right there. And he says, I want you to right here, right now, in your sphere of influence, I want you to take this message, this goodness, this message of repentance and turn back to him. Repent from your mindset that says, I, I can find satisfaction in something other than what I was created to find satisfaction in. Repent of the fact that, I, that I, I think that my human condition and my intellect or whatever, I think all these man-made plots and plans, I think that, that their views of success, uh, repent of, the, of, of holding those up as superior to what God says. And we heard it this morning, right? Seek first the kingdom of God, and what? And then all this stuff gets added unto you. <laughs> how is that, how is that, that all I do is just like surrender and trust and respond to his invitation to get married, and then 
we learn that about what covenant is in the Hebrew culture. What's mine is yours and what's yours, right? You, there is an inheritance. So I get when I get married to the bridegroom, I get all of, of what he's stored up for me. I get to spend all of, of his resources and all his wealth. So why would I think that I have lack and that I need to worry about tomorrow? Because I know how much I've been blessed with. I know how rich, I know how loaded my father is. So he says, I want you to spend it liberally. And, I, and it starts right here in Jerusalem. It starts right here in Hilo. That, as Brother encouraged us, right, it's, it's, there, are, there are people who need to hear that there is someone who will really genuinely meet them right where they are. That they're hurt and the stuff that they've gone through, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm s- in my own life, my own experience, and those that I get to minister and visit with, it's just amazing how when the enemy gets in and, and convinces somebody of something that isn't true, how sticky that is, how persistent that untruth is, and how it takes something to break that and say, okay, I, I, I got it. My eyes are open to what's really true. That that circumstance, that painful event, that rejection, that humiliation, that failure, that, that brokenness, that abuse, that whatever, that those situations that God takes that and he turns that into something beautiful in my life. And that it doesn't mean that I am less than. It doesn't mean that I'm secondhand goods. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. It means that he's still handing me a personal invitation to the wedding feast. He's saying, here's the cup. Would you drink of the cup and ratify the covenant of intimate relationship that I want to have for you? That he's handing that invitation to us. And then the rest of our journey is just, I don't say what I feel. I say what's true. I begin to speak what's true. I begin to let my mind be transformed to say and proclaim what's true because he is true. He is what is true. And he's the one that when I, when I come into alignment with him, that's when I start to live the life of an heir. I start to live the life of somebody who gets to spend because this is what my, this is what my spouse has and it's mine too. So he's inviting us into this, into this place of experience, experience with him. And, it, and yet you can't go around the message that it involves repentance. And repentance says, God, I, I humble myself. I don't have all the goods. You got all the goods. Would you change me from the inside out? And that's what starts with inviting him for that moment and responding to him. And as Peter says just after, he says, I want you to hang around until you're, you're wrapped, this version says, until you're wrapped or enveloped with the Holy Spirit, which is kind of a cool thought. But, but it, as Peter said, after that experience happened in Acts, he says, I want you to, you repent, you get baptized, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You go after the whole meal deal, and God invites you to that. So if you haven't experienced that, God's inviting you to that today as well. So today there's an invitation, and we're going to celebrate it. And um, if, you, if you're a lover of the Lord and you've already invited him to be Lord of your life, then this table is open to you to, to renew our vows to one another in participating in communion. So if the ushers would go ahead and uh, distribute, the, distribute the, um, the cup for us, please. Just to have in your mind this, the, uh, the picture of, the, of this goblet and invitation you can put that slide back up Dakota of the wedding where the other one go it's over on the side can you put back up the slide with the cup please so we have a covenant keeping God covenant making God who ratifies every every covenant with blood and the cup represents the blood and today uh and today we're, we're reminded that the ultimate invitation of his covenant with you is a, is a marriage invitation. His covenant with Abraham at, it dealt with, you know, uh, that he was going to, he was going to be fruitful and that his, his, he was going to have this land and that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. That's a pretty cool promise. His promise to Moses and the children of Israel was to give them the land that he promised to Abraham. That was a pretty cool promise. That was pretty awesome. But the promise that he offers to you, the invitation he offers to you is a, a marriage promise, a marriage covenant, a marriage invitation, saying, would you just not be too busy to come and enter the celebration with him? Because everything outside of these doors, everything that isn't what his 
has provided and the path that he's is disappointing to say the least is is empty and is a counterfeit of what God has in all of his richness for you <coughs> there's so much that's that's promised and that we get to draw from in our communion experience high tech cups so I just want to invite us all as we before we partake of the bread together to respond to the initial invitation that says yes I want to respond and I want to come to that wedding feast to respond to the initial invitation that says, I'm, I'm down on one knee and I'm offering the ring. Would you accept? And to respond to that initial invitation today. So if, if you haven't invited Jesus Christ to be Lord and the Savior of your life, then today is the day. This is the best day to get started on the journey. It is quite a journey. Doesn't mean everything becomes, uh, you know, pleasant and, right, God... God takes us through circumstances and situations, but he promises in every one of those circumstances to form us into his character, and he can be trusted. Whether it seems painful or hard or easy, doesn't matter. Our job is to just say, I trust you, and I obey. So, Father, we thank you for your covenant. We thank you for the promise that you extend and the invitation that you extend this morning. Lord, and we get to, we get to renew our vows this morning. So, Lord, we say that we invite you to be Lord and Savior of our lives. God, even those of us who have been walking for a while and, and uh, maybe have uh, not done so, so great in our obedience, we renew our covenant and our contract with you, and we say be Lord of our lives. God, help us transform us, change us, change the way we think. God, we choose to put our trust in you, to trust first and foremost in you, and to let you take care of all those other things that will be added to us by our just trusting and putting you first in our lives. So we do that this morning. We say, Jesus, you're number one. We surrender to you. God, make us into the men and women of God that you have destined and created us to be. Father, we bring before you all of our, our hurts and our misconceptions. We bring before you all of our hurts, all of the areas where we've believed the lie of the enemy about who we are. God, we bring before you all the areas where we've believed a lie about who you are. That you don't care because of circumstances or things that we've been through. Or that somehow you weren't there and that you've let us down. God, we just allow your Holy Spirit to renew our thinking. To know a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. Never. Never. Never leaves us or forsakes us that through all the circumstances and even things that have happened to us that weren't our fault, God, that you will turn that into something beautiful and glorious in our lives and that nowhere does anything that's happened to us lessen your love for us. So, God, we accept your grace. We accept your forgiveness. We accept the blood of Jesus to wash away all that was before. And we enter into a new day, a new promise of relationship with you. So as we partake of the bread together, we thank you, God, that it's by your stripes that we're healed. We thank you, Lord, that among the things that we get to inherit as your bride, that we get to inherit health in our bodies. God, you've broken every curse. You've established that we get to experience your life and life more abundantly. So Lord, as we partake to today, if there's any areas of our body that need physical healing, we just let your as this becomes a part of our body and our DNA. God, we thank you, God, that you're correcting and rectifying anything that needs to be adjusted. God, that you're bringing us into perfect health. Let's all partake of the bread together. <coughs> 